three, two, one, and we are recording. And I am with George. How are you, my friend? Hello, and thank you for uh, having me here. I'm uh, I'm doing well. I mean, the the days that we're living in, you know, it's been the craziest upswing over the past couple of days as as far as the crypto market goes, and uh, it reflects everywhere. Our clients are happy. We're happy. The whole ecosystem is happy. So it is a bit of a bonanza going on right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, I have like a couple, maybe one or two days delay in terms of like my uh, like premiering schedule or whatever. But uh, just to just to kind of maybe highlight the situation. So what happened, I guess, yesterday? Uh, yeah, what did happen? I mean, did you I, I mean, I, I kind of roughly know, but the, like what did the price exactly do? I'm not entirely sure. I mean, the, the, the price obviously skyrocketed. The Bitcoin broke through, uh, you know, the 20,000 ES price point, which was the previous, I guess, psychological uh, barrier, you know, the previous all-time high that everyone had, had in the space. So it's uh, the top is off. It's in price discovery mode again. Everyone's extremely excited. It's, it's as if, you know, Bitcoin got the monkey off its back that it's been holding for the last three years since the so 2017 true. crash. So yeah, 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 yeah. Well said, well said. Yeah, no, I think uh, interesting times. You know, I, I usually try and stay away from all time high talk just because um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I th- I feel like there's enough content out there, people reporting on, you know, oh, the trading and this and that. Um, so uh, maybe let's let's start with where you and I first met. I'm trying to remember. I I, uh, I, I think it must have been just like online mostly, right? I mean, I know I'd heard about you sometime, but I don't think had we met in person. <laughs> uh, I think it was through Techstars, if I'm not mistaken. So back in 2019. Um, mm. And just uh, for a bit of context, uh, you know, I'm, I'm George. We uh, run uh, uh, a crypto custodian out of Toronto called Balance. You can find us on balance.ca. Mm. We didn't start with a crypto custodian. And, uh, you know, this business has been running since 2017. And we went through a few iterations as far as what's something that would actually make sense to have in the market that would enable ecosystem participants to mm. do something cool on top. Uh, Around 2019 is when we we did decide to go all in on uh, on the custody side of it, and uh, obviously with custody you're dealing with large enterprise clients, uh, you know, established businesses, regulated businesses. It's a four six month sales cycle, so bootstrapping was out of the question for us. We got into uh, TechStars, the the Toronto 2019 program, and then I I believe around the same time is when we got introduced by uh, was it Jenny or was it Mike? If I'm not mistaken, Mike, Mike Radkin or Jenny Kalchenko, like it was, it, it, it was one of them. So it came as a warm introduction to someone that knew you. And yeah, that's, yeah, uh, yeah. We first and I've been, opportunity. I've been hearing some great things. You know, obviously we're gonna, I want to get into uh, the custody offering. I know you guys have been putting a lot of work into that, <clears throat> um, and 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 some great results there. Um, but I was gonna say, you know, um, I'm really so I'm calling this this kind of like Bitcoin stories. George, and the idea is to really, you know, um, capture like people's stories <laughs> before they got into Bitcoin and, and then post Bitcoin, right? And I, I like to see Bitcoin as a bit of a singularity event where, you know what I mean, where for many of us, it, it kind of uh, impacted the arc of our global view, our careers, um, you it's know, just so many things. Yeah, it's like a black hole more like <laughs> orange hole um but no i was gonna say is is that uh, yeah really curious what does your background kind of look like and and are, are you from are you from around uh, toronto or from elsewhere i mean for uh, whoever might be listening I, I i believe you've noticed a bit of an eastern european accent at this point you could be maybe faking it though more. i don't know i don't know maybe you're faking it for the girls no i'm kidding <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it works better than an Indian accent or some other accents. <laughs> uh, I wish, I wish it would have worked. Not, like not so well, not so well. <laughs> maybe we need a different one, like a, a Latino accent or something. <laughs> maybe I need to work on the hair a bit as well. But, uh, <laughs> Both of us. Okay, anyway, uh, sorry, sorry. Continue, continue. I'm, uh, I, I'm Romanian by origin. I'm a dual citizen Romanian-Canadian. I moved to Canada around uh, 2010. Uh, came here to do a master's in computer science at McGill University in Montreal. And, uh, you know, to paraphrase Jay-Z, came here for school, graduated into crypto. And, uh, you know, it's been a wild ride since. So at some point, five, seven years into uh, into the journey in Canada, I decided that, you know what, like this is probably going to be my new uh, home base for the foreseeable future. Uh, 
Now to come a bit into uh, how we got involved into this and my my background is uh, you know like I'm a I'm a technologist at heart. Uh, computer science and physics is what what drove me very early on. Um, I hold a bachelor's in computer science from uh, University of Alexandria on Cusa in uh, Yash, Romania, and a master's in computer science from McGill. At McGill, I spent two and a half years in the reasoning and learning lab, working under the supervisor, uh, the supervision, sorry, of uh, Doena Prekop. Uh, she mm -hmm. was the Dean of Undergraduate Studies, uh, running the reasoning and learning lab. And uh, most recently, I believe she's been running the DeepMind team out of uh, Montreal for the last cool. few years. OK. OK, interesting. OK, so so yeah, we'll continue, continue. Go ahead. So. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a side of me really likes crypto because of the hardcore, uh, you, you know, uh, cryptography aspect behind it. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm look. Everyone loves loves finance, and obviously, everyone likes to make money. But I am one of those guys. Like I truly am, am in it for the technology. Uh, <laughs> there's a side of me that likes, uh, you know, like AI um, and machine learning as well. Uh, I specialize in uh, unsupervised learning, and then obviously, uh, you know, like with uh, with with Doena, there was a bit of work leading into deep learning as well. Which, back in 2012, 2013, when I was wrapping up my master's thesis, that was just slowly emerging and becoming, uh, you know, highly used in in practice and in, in in the industry worldwide. <clears throat> that is fascinating, uh, George. I didn't even know that. I didn't know that you had a, a background in AI. You know, it's funny because in every single, so I'm on episode, I don't know, 50 something. Um, and uh, almost every episode, one of my kind of tailing end questions is AI, like just generally speaking, what, you know, what people's thoughts are, because it's something that I, well, I mean, I don't think I have a specialty in it at all, but I definitely have an interest in it. And uh and really curious. I mean, I'm kind of jumping into the weeds, um, but but do you, do you see any threads between blockchain and AI? I mean, more short term, mid term, long term. That's a that's actually a very interesting question. Um, I don't necessarily see. Uh, well, okay. Let me. There there is one angle through which AI and blockchain, you know, like have a. You know, like uh, it's kind of marriage made in heaven type integration, as far as I can see. Uh, and then there's, a, you know, and that's still a few years off. And I think for for the moment, there isn't necessarily. But just just to, to gather and explain my my thoughts properly, uh, most of uh, you know the the most exciting thing that I see right now happening with AI, as far as I can tell, is uh, you know uh, natural language models like GPT three, the work that OpenAI is doing. Uh, you know, really exciting. The, mm. the language model that they've built, you know, 13 billion parameters or however many they have, which is, you know, quite like an order of magnitude bigger than, than GPT-2, uh, that enables a whole new range of applications. And those applications will be mostly centered around digital assistance, uh, you know, uh, online avatars, uh, you know, I like think someone that can do anything that you might typically do online and, and automate all those pieces for you because it understands your needs, preferences. That's kind of where I see the, the main applications of, of uh, this natural language models going into. Doesn't necessarily tie directly into crypto. So I don't see a, a straightforward, uh, you know, here's how, how AI and crypto could come in together. Now, there is one, uh, uh, one area around AI and, you know, which is particularly around, uh, I guess what I would call an evolution of the federated learning model where you can probably train some uh, machine learning algorithms, anything from language models to, you know, like uh, roaring algorithms that, you know, send, send people out in the streets uh, when you're trying to get from, from home to work. Uh, a, a, a lot of the current implementations rely on, a, you know, like you run this machine learning locally on people's mobile devices and phones and tablets, but then whatever was actually learned from the from the data that that stays stored locally, you know, like with the user's device, gets sent over as as an update to the model's parameters over to some centralized server that needs to do a, an aggregation of those, mm -hmm. and then send over the next round of updates. Uh, you know, like here's the new global model parameters so we can redo your learning again on the local device and maybe we can get to better fit of the model that way. Um, the need to rely on a, uh, and, and trust like a central uh, server to do that kind of aggregation and build the next global state is I believe something where 
maybe the blockchain would be, uh, you know, like a fit from that perspective. Let's try to figure out a, a decentralized uh, machine learning model, effectively. Mm, interesting. Interesting. So I guess just to go back to your story then, George, uh, what, I mean, what does that look like? So I guess you you said you you studied in Romania. You also, uh, you know, work with some pretty, pretty, it sounds like prolific people um, in, in the AI space here. And then I guess when, when, when did you get kind of bit by the, you know, the, the crypto bug? Or the Bitcoin bug or whatever. <laughs> as it uh, as it kind of goes, I was aware of uh, of all of this since uh, what was it, two thousand and eight, like late two thousand and eight. Mm. So, uh, two thousand and eight is when I was in my second year of my bachelor's, I guess, and that's when all of the cool computer science stuff was starting to kick in in the curriculum. So mm. cryptography, information security. Uh, you know, like we had dedicated chapters around digital payment methods, uh, digital money. You know, we, we learned all of that stuff about hash cash and B money. And, um, you know, like it's uh, it, it was looked upon as, a, you know, here, here's some some really edge stuff that's being tried out, to, you know, as far as cryptography goes for for real life applications. Like none, not, not even the, the teachers were taking it seriously when they were teaching it to some degree. It was like the, the 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 digital money piece was always that last chapter in that you know like optional assignment <laughs> at the end of the course when everyone was preparing for the exam. So, okay. Uh, I had a few friends that were you know like pretty into this kind of stuff. So you know like I had a, a really good friend that was studying Ruby and doing all the cool stuff that uh, you know like the kids weren't necessarily doing in class, and he he brought up this whole uh, hey, have you heard about Bitcoin? Like, oh, this is happening. You can mine mm. it. You can download the software. Do this and that. And, uh, you know, like, I'd, if I'm not mistaken, like, I even downloaded the core software. At some point, I mined some stuff. It was on a wallet. The wallet got lost. I think it was in, in my Dropbox for, you know, like, two, three years throughout college. And then that went out with a cleanup, like, one uh, like one day. So uh, I knew about it. I heard about it. I tried it out. This is cool. Uh, I was too young to, frankly, grasp it and wrap my head around it as far as what are the potential implications of this. I could see the technological innovation. I could see that this is brand new computer science. You know, there, there were some some fundamental breakthroughs as far as, uh, you know, like how do we bring in a the distributed, you know, like consensus uh, algorithm, uh, uh, you know, to, to basically build what's, a, you know, like a, to, to arrive at distributed consensus and, you know, Putting in all the nice stuff from computer science, the, the strong cryptography, the proof of work hashing scheme. So, you know, like it wasn't as if all of those things didn't exist, but the way that they were put in within the, 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 the Bitcoin white paper was quite novel and it was a, it was a breakthrough. Uh, I didn't get at all the implications about what this could do to finance, you know, like what's, uh, I didn't even know what, what, what a fiat currency is, what, you know, like hard money, soft money, none of that. So it went fully over my head. I forgot about it, you know, just buried it, did my master's, uh, you know, run a startup. And then around 2013 is uh, when I took contact with it again. I reread read the white paper a few times and every time I would read it, I'm like, this is just, this makes more and more sense. <laughs> you know, there's always like a, how can you fit so much in eight, nine pages? Is this consistent? Like, could it be mm. implemented a different way? And just, it seems that the, the more you go from white paper to how would a real world implementation would look like, there's only one, one straightforward path that you can take. And that was really interesting. And then around 2014, 2015, like when uh, when Ethereum had their uh, their uh, their coin offering, and uh, you know, like eventually the network went live, I guess in July 2015, if I'm not mistaken, something along along those lines. Um, that happened right across the corner uh, from from where I was living, literally speaking. Like on Spadina Street, Bitcoin the Central was 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 right there. Cool. You know, it was, it was the hub at the time. Like it was a lot of buzz. Vitalik would show up and uh, you know, like meet meet the people and and explain the project. And I read their uh, their white paper, and I'm like, okay, pff, mind blown. Then I, <laughs> then I got it. Let me get back to Bitcoin. This makes a lot of sense. Turing complete, word computer, amazing. This whole crypto stuff is got got very interesting for me very fast. And uh, I almost quit my job at the time to effectively build decentralized applications on top of Ethereum. I didn't end up doing the jump then. I did it two, three years later. I watched the space. 
You know, like I, uh, I remember like even with, with my co-founder in this business, like we, uh, we, we watched live in the command line as the first Ethereum transaction went, went live through the system, you know, got, got broadcast right after the, the network launch 2017, early 2017, you know, like I figured, you know what, I, uh, I'm probably better off if I switch spaces, uh, and, and, and then go into this industry because, uh, you know, it's, it's really exciting what's happening. And even if it takes another three to five years until it gets to any sort of adoption, the, the gene is out of the bottle. So there's there's not going to be any more stopping to it. There's it, It's not going to be with, uh, um, but, you know, like with, I, I don't see this being stopped in any sort of sense. It's like the steam engine. We know how to build it. It got created. Even if someone destroys all the steam engines tomorrow, we know how to make a new one. So that's, that's how I look at it. <clears throat> interesting, interesting, fascinating. Um, so I'm just curious, like in that in that kind of span, though, when you went from uh, like not being serious about it to eventually, you know, seeing the Ethereum white paper and being super convinced that this was the future, were there other things that that kind of happened that that you know that kind of led you towards this? Like, I mean, because you said you know you were much younger back then, um, but were there like things like did you have questions around, I don't know, money, finance? Were you coming at it more from like? like uh like a philosophical more from a technology technology i guess you, you explained that you said the technology was what really kept cap- captivated your imagination right the technology 100 percent. like when, when when we started this business in 2017 so just a, a bit of uh you know like outside of crypto the last major uh you know like gig i guess uh, that i did was uh you know what a, what a technology startup that was in the digital media space uh, it's called 500 pixels I mean, it's 500px.com it's uh, you know like one of uh one of the largest uh photo sharing websites that's out there you know it's mm. 15 16 million <clears throat> photographers worldwide the collection of photos is you know 150 to 100 million wide probably more at this point um i spent three and a half years with them very well you know uh, uh very uh you know, top tier early stage company, like funding from Andreessen Horowitz and a series A. Uh, Andreessen Horowitz doesn't typically invest across the board into Canada. Um, you know, like so, some of the best and most most talented people that I've seen, you know, like were attracted to, to the company and to the space, myself included, on the attracted part, not on the talented part. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, not, I'm not patting myself on the back here. But uh <clears throat> I spent three and a half years with them and I got to scratch every technical itch that I wanted to scratch. Uh, you know, I started on a senior position, helping them build out their commercial licensing marketplace. Uh, you know, there was a lot of content. So we figured uh, may- maybe the photographers can can make some money by selling royalty free licenses on it as well. Mm. Uh, eventually, I transitioned into a director of engineering role. Uh, eventually the CTO stepped down into a director of R&D role because there was a, there was a strong need at that time to actually leverage some of the deep learning stuff that was happening as far as, uh, you know, let's figure out what we can do with this photo collection to improve our search, to improve our filtering, to improve our rec- recommendation engine. Um, you know, and I, there was a, there was a period of time of roughly like a year, a year and a half where it was myself, him, another director of engineering and 35, 40 engineers that we had to, uh, you know, uh, figure out to uh, make sure that they they deliver there's a clear roadmap the expectations and uh, uh, you know like what what we're actually building is well understood uh, i got to build every piece of technology that i wanted to build three and a half years in i figured uh, you know what this is great um, but at this point in my career i'm a lot more interested about the space that i'm in and the impact that my work could have rather than what piece of tech am i using or you know what is the project that i'm working on and when i took a 10,000 foot view at it, digital media and uh, photo licensing wasn't it. So I figured mm-hmm. that, that was a great learning experience, but uh, I need to get back to the drawing board, so to say, and take a look at where I want to be. I did a very quick stint in the pharma space, uh, you know, got involved with, uh, with a company that was trying to develop anti sensor nucleotide uh, therapeutics. So, it's new, you know, this kind of uh, mRNA type of vaccines and drugs that you see emerging, like that's, that's uh, what, what that is about. That didn't turn out necessarily to be for me. Uh, back to the drawing board, uh, and you know, crypto just kind of came out of nowhere. I'm like, okay, this is hardcore cryptography, computer science. It's finance. It's money. I don't know how money works. Let's find out. And the, the whole finance and uh, uh, you know, legal and regulatory aspect of it, like I, those were uh, you know, like let's let's learn them as we build the business. <clears throat> hey, so 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 I mean, you, you kind of uh, touched on it, but like, how money works? How money works? Like, 
what a what a profound you know question right and 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 it's one of those eternal questions that i've i've been you know pondering about quite some time as well and i find it fascinating that almost everybody in the world cares about money but almost nobody that i've ever met can actually explain you know what bitcoin or what money is rather <laughs> um i'm not going to put you on the spot right but but i always find that question around money um fascinating and so so that and, and and that is how a lot of people really start to appreciate bitcoin but are, but are there any things on that point that you want to maybe share like in terms of like insights that you maybe didn't have prior to oh, asking that question easy, around how, what is the money? answer yeah yeah very yeah. easy answer i don't know either <laughs> yeah yeah exactly that <laughs> exactly that that's the best answer i don't know that's the best answer yeah because it is like an enigma right it's like will we ever know a bit and uh, look these systems and uh, like money as a you can look at it from all sorts of angles obviously right and like no no particular feature fully capture what what it is but uh, you know once one aspect that money has is is being used as a means of exchange right as far as uh, exchanging goods and services goes uh, there's a whole history of literally that dates back thousands of years from you know the, the back in days when people used to do barter and uh, you know, it's kind of go to, uh, I trust you that you're going to return back what you need to return back. Uh, you know, like all the way into today where we have digital money and like you pay with a uh, tap on a POS system when you go to, you know, like the checkout at a grocery store. Uh, those, the, the you know, like a, a lot of the money as a means of exchange aspect of it is driven by social conventions and social conventions change, evolve, you know, vary across cultures, you know, so that, like I can't necessarily give you a cohesive definition of, yes, this is exactly how money works because on a, you know, in a different part of the world, on the opposite side of the globe, we're going to find someone that has, uh, you know, like maybe, maybe a different uh, interpretation or, or use or established convention and protocol for, for exchanging it. Uh, at the core of it, you know, the, the way I look at it, it's a, it's a useful, like, I don't want to say that money is a fiction because obviously there's uh, there's some very real aspects to it. But as a social convention, it's a very useful social convention that we have that allows us to, uh, you know, like operate a society in, a, in an efficient fashion, which is, uh, again, I have something that I'm producing that maybe you want, uh, you know, like what's the easiest way for us to get into an agreement as far as executing a trade and, uh, you know, like here, here's something that you would need when you need it and what do I get back that would allow me to redeem the equivalent amount of value, uh, you know, like from a, another provider of goods and services for something that I want when, when I want it. You can do that with shells. You can do that with, uh, you know, uh, greenback dollars. You can do it with fiat dollars. You can do it with cigarettes in a prison. So that's what that's what I'm saying. It all it, it is from that angle all about uh, social conventions uh, and established protocols of exchange. Yeah, 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 fascinating, fascinating. Okay, and then I guess uh, so. Just to go back to your story, then, so you, you're captivated by this. You're like, I'm gonna make a move into this space. But how do you, how do you enter? You know, how do you make a move? Because and and by the way, just to back up a little bit, like one of my goals, uh, George, with this podcast or whatever you want to call this, is to. Um, inspire more people to not just like buy and huddle, like that's kind of an obvious strategy now, but rather to build on top of Bitcoin, right? Like build a business, build, I don't know, build software, build, build something, right? Uh, become a miner, but build on top of Bitcoin. Don't just sit there and, and you know, NGU number go up. And so that's why I'm, I'm so fascinated <laughs> by, by people's, uh, you know, stories and then how they actually somehow manage to become full time. And, and I also respect and recognize that, you know, that, that myself included, our paths aren't always like a straight line. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's like uh, <laughs> you're up one day down the next, but that's part of, I guess, I don't know, part of it though. No? <laughs> but yeah, what, where, where's it's your story go? Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I love it. The number go up uh, investment strategy. Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it works. Uh, no financial advice, but uh, no, no, we're not financial advisors. Yeah. Ask uh, your friend. Uh, yeah. As far as where I'm at with it, you know, like I'm, uh, you know, the saying goes like, don't risk anything that you can to lose. So uh, I decided to risk my livelihood, business, reputation and career on it. And we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah, that kind of hit close to home. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, 
and look, I will, uh, I will say this. It's, there's a lot of, um, I guess, uh, origin stories that founders have, you know, which is, uh, you know, like I was doing this and then I ran into this issue and then I solved it for myself and then I figured out how to solve it for other people and it all grew. And a, a lot of that is, you know, uh, post fact, once the company is successful, it gets uh, mythologized to some degree and, and, and presented like that. Um, you know, like I, I don't, I don't want to pull a slide of hand like that. So I'll, I'll tell you the story as it, as it, as it kind of happened. And uh, you know, like there's a lot of examples of very, very successful uh, businesses and entrepreneurs that got started this way. I take a pragmatic approach to it. It wasn't like I woke up one morning and I got this ha ah, like vision that dawned on me, and I'm like, okay, Canada <laughs> needs crypto custody, and right, I'm right. gonna go and build it. And when it's done, they'll come. And it wasn't like that. It was a uh, um, you know, like this space is interesting. The technological innovation is definitely there. Like I've been through uh, through enough school to be able to recognize it, you know? So I, I knew that that was real. As far as real life and practical applications and can this be money? Can this be a store of value? Uh, can you use it for more than that? Like, is there a point in having 5,000 uh, cryptocurrencies rather than just one? Those were all working hypotheses. And, you know, to some degree for me, they, they still are. Uh, the space was interesting. The, the technology innovation was there. So I figured, what could we build that's cool? And uh, uh, I'm a big believer of skin in the game. You can't... Uh, if you don't have skin in the game and, uh, you know, to some degree, like it's, it's part joking, but part real. Like if you don't have your livelihood depending on it, especially if you're to take, you know, serious decisions around your business, around, you know, how you guide your life to a large degree, uh, you'll be exposed to moral hazard. Like you need to uh, be able to live the consequences of your decisions. Otherwise, your decisions might not necessarily be the right decisions. So the very first thing that I wanted to do is, okay, let me get a little bit of skin in the game and let me set up a, a portfolio of my own, right? So I'm like, let's, let's take some of my own savings, uh, figure out how to get exposure to the asset class and we'll take it from there. And that's kind of where it, where it stopped because that process back in 2017 revolved around, I got to open up accounts with, you know, like five exchanges worldwide, some more sketched than others. Uh, companies that have PO boxes listed as their corporate address on the website and, you know, like a banking partner that's, that's in Japan or in some offshore, and uh, they're going to do custody of the assets uh, for me, you know, and I'm not even entirely sure if the assets are mine or theirs in a lot of those contractual arrangements. And I'm just going to send money to five places and uh, worldwide and trust them on good faith that they're not going to take it from me, which, you know, has proven repeatedly, you know, like over the years, not necessarily to be the case. And uh, at the end of the day, I still need to run my trades one by one, figure out what I want to buy, how to buy it, look at candlestick charts. And, and that's all good and fine and dandy. And, you know, it's very exciting if you want to be an active trader. And it's, it's very exciting if you do the work and, you know, like what, what you're doing and that's such a, how you want to spend my time. That's not how I wanted to spend my time. So I'm like, why is this so complicated? This is by no means anything that, you know, like my mom or dad or brother-in-law or sister use, you know? Uh, and I was contrasting it with even some of the, you know, existing, I guess, more more modern product offerings from, from challenger banks, like uh, you could argue uh, Tangerine and ING in Canada. Like mm -hmm. I, I can go to ING and uh, they're getting a free plug. ING come sponsor us if you're listening to this. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> you could uh, you could go to ING and say, look, I wanna I wanna invest five thousand uh, mm. dollars. They'll say, okay, here's a questionnaire. What's your risk appetite? What's your investment horizon? What are your goals? And they'll say, okay, here's your you know pre-built medium growth portfolio. That's I don't know forty percent uh, Canadian Treasury bonds, and then the other sixty percent is a combination of uh, you know stock market indices that cover the TSX uh, you know top sixty S and P five hundred, and then maybe there's the uh, you know like uh, something in uh, in in Europe uh, and some maybe a real estate or emerging market index into the mix as well with a, with a small percentage. Uh, all done for you. Right. So I'm like, here's my money. And then it kind of sort of acts like cash in the sense that if you want to cash it out, you know, like T plus two to settle and it's back into your savings account. Figured, okay, that's great. Like, why don't we have this in crypto? What would it take to build it? And that's, that's how we started back in 2017. Let's make the process that I just went through like a bit easier. And uh, <clears throat> to, to a lot of uh, 
to a lot of degrees and I'll, I'll throw another plug there, but I, I think they're great. And they're, they're just, a, you know, like a, a, a great company and a great, uh, innovation and success story that we have in Canada, Walt simple, the robo advisor, they recently launched Walt simple digital assets, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. You know, like allows you to kind of like what a, a click of a button, uh, do effectively what I've, what I've been describing. Mm-hmm. We were looking at building something similar. I'm like, can we make it a one button click to, to get this done now? we were naive and at the beginning of the journey and, uh, you know, like obviously half an hour of research and we realized that that would trigger every type of registration that's in the books with the security regulators in Ontario and like in all, all other jurisdictions where we would want to sell. So uh, we took it from there and uh, we figured, okay, can we, can this be done in such a way that it don't necessarily end up creating any sort of financial security or investment contract behind the scenes. And then the rabbit hole went, went, went deeper. Okay, we have to fully segregate the assets for each client. We have to make sure not to create shared risk between them, you know, like horizontally. We need to make sure that we're not creating any shared risk between us and them by mixing in our own inventory and liquidity with theirs. Uh, we need to deliver the assets immediately uh, post-trade. However, you know, you know, like whether they buy it from us or from wherever they buy it, but the assets need to be delivered on chain to a wallet that they own and control and the commodity got delivered sense of the word. Uh, the legal title and full ownership should be theirs. There shouldn't be any sort of encumbrance on the assets itself or, or, or any sort of pledge or hypothecation, uh, you know, like happening. And then when you put, you know, like A plus B plus C plus D together, <clears throat> we arrived at this, uh, you, you know, like picture of this is what it would take to build something along the lines of all simple digital assets. And that looked a lot like a crypto custodian. And, uh, you know, like we, we called a few custodians at the time to try to figure out, like, can, can we build this, you know, like, can we get a, you know, like a, just a vendor relationship in place effectively, you know, and, and build it in partnership with someone and say, look, you have the custody business, like I want to run this uh, retail on ramp, you know, I'm targeting, you know, middle class, upper middle class professionals, uh, they're coming in with some decent sized amounts, it's not $10 a trade, it's maybe, you know, like, 5,000 at a minimum to, 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 to start getting into it. Uh, but none, nonetheless, like I will need probably like a few tens of thousands of wallets. I need them to be done under at least a bailment agreement. If, you know, like if trust structure would be even better, like if you, uh, you know, like can't act as a fiduciary for them, I need the legal title to be passed to them. Like this is what I need for my clients if I'm to build this type of product. And what we were hearing back in 2017 was, yeah, yeah, yes, we can do that maybe, but you, you know, like there's a 1 million minimum per wallet or 10 million minimum per wallet and you got to pay us 1% per year in fees and it has to be done through support. I'm like, okay, this, is, this isn't going to make any sort of sense. Uh, we're engineers and we can probably do better. So let's try to do better. So we started building our own custodial infrastructure behind the scenes to power that business, which, you know, eventually down the line, when we realized that this custodial infrastructure is actually a very valuable piece for the ecosystem as a whole, we decided to, to, to jump the gun and, you know, go, go full time into it. But that's, that, that's how we started with it. So, you know, to some degree, there's, a, there's an aspect of we try to scratch our own itch there because we, we had this idea for a business model in mind uh, for which none of the existing solutions delivered. So we decided to build our own. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip a few steps and I'm, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let you tell me what I should dive deeper into. But one and a half years of building later, we had a first working solution that was sturdy enough for us. And then with another, you know, like six months of polish, there was a product offering that we can now bring to the rest of the businesses into the space, over-the-counter trading desks, trading and exchange platforms, uh, lenders, ATM networks, uh, you know, fairly flexible solution that can address a lot of those verticals. And uh, late 2019, so we, we started this in early 2017, late 2019 is when we arrived at a version of the product that delivered enough value for a client that we could get a first client in through the door, you know, uh, over the counter, uh, retail trading app, uh, you know, like with, uh, and we delivered for them what they couldn't get elsewhere with any of the custodians that I mentioned then more, uh, you know, so basically they ran into the same pain point that we ran back in 2017, late 2019, two years later, and the problem still isn't necessarily fully fixed. And at that point we had a working solution that was, that, that was good enough. We got a first client in through the door and, uh, we've just been building and growing since. <clears throat> Interesting. Interesting. Um, 
uh, you're not you're obviously those, those are private relationships right in terms of like the who you're custodying for and all that you're, you're not that's not on your website or anything like that right george i mean i don't want to um uh, i'm just curious like are you able to share any of that or not really some of them are more public than others uh mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, there's nothing to to hide here, but there is the, the the financial privacy aspect of it, which obviously, you know, if a client doesn't feel comfortable with disclosing a relationship with us or the fact that we're holding their assets, uh, you know, right, like right. without their consent, like I wouldn't, uh, you know, publish or mention anything. But we do have a few mm -hmm. clients, and we do have a few, uh, I would argue, very high profile clients that that work with us, that you know, love us, publicly disclose us, and promote us in, in you know, like all the places that they can. Um, so give you a few examples. So uh, Newton is one of them, and they're one of our earliest clients. Uh, mm -hmm. Newton's uh, no fee retail trading app in uh, in Canada. They offer a very simple experience to uh, you know buy buy and sell, and the whole piece is handled by us. Uh, <clears throat> DV Chain is another uh, you know like the very high valued client for us. Uh, they're one one of the largest. Uh, over the trade, uh, uh, sorry, over the counter uh, trading desk out there. They're realistically one of the largest worldwide. Uh, you know, like their Genesis, Cumberland, Galaxy Digital Scale. Uh, they, uh, you know, like as far as liquidity goes in Canada, I think they is like 60, 70% of the volume of trades that happen, happen through them. And where they're uh, de facto custodian. Uh, obviously, only have so much visibility into their business, but they do trade in the, you know, like uh, billions, double digit billions a month, maybe these days. Uh, we do hold some assets for them and uh, worldwide. So they, they oh, don't operate in Canada. Kind of. So hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a global operation. Uh, DFX, which is an institutional trading platform. They use your custody for their global trading or they use it just for Canada or they use it? For both uh, global so we're we're, oh, wow. we're their official partner I mean, and, so uh, wait, what, what 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 were the factors that that made them choose you guys because if i'm not mistaking it's not like a like because there is this term right like this regulatory term which is like qualified custodian and mm -hmm. if i if i understand correctly it's we're not talking about that right we're talking about can, can you kind of dig in a bit deeper in terms of like what uh what it means to be a custodian and and yes, uh, and why companies yes, yes, yes. yeah <clears throat> Um, I will try to keep it brief because I can, uh, you know, like this is yet another rabbit hole that we can spend, you know, just mm. a full po podcast episode on just this. But uh, to make a long story short, you have certain types of businesses like over the counter trading desks are one example. If you just trade what I, you, I would argue and a lot of people, including regulators are starting to come out with the frameworks, you know, like doing the, the split of roles and responsibility and, and, and definitions that that exact way, um, digital commodities. So there are certain uh, assets in the space. Bitcoin is the you know uh, most prominent example, I guess. Um, Ethereum as well. Uh, they're 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 categorized as digital commodities. If you trade the digital commodities and you immediately deliver the commodity to a client-owned and controlled wallet immediately post trade. And if you have your own liquidity pool, you trade your own capital, uh, there's no requirement for you to use a qualified custodian of any sorts or any custodian that meets any regulatory status or definition or, or, or framework. Um, obviously, you know, like it's very appealing for a lot of these clients to know that the, the custodians that they use like has all those necessary checks and checks and balances and, uh, you know, like designations in place. But the reality of it is the space is just emerging, you know, and, and a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, like... Uh, uh, you know, like, uh, how should I put it? I, I don't want to call them badges because they're, they're, they're a lot more than that. But uh, the solutions that are emerging, I, you know, like this is, we're at, with, we're at the forefront of the industry. Uh, there's no qualified custodian in Canada at the moment, for example. You know, so it's, uh, we have the best working thing that's out there, I would argue. Uh, you, you know, like as, as far as, uh, can we get to a point where, say, a scheduled bank would be able to use us for their crypto custody needs? There's still a little bit of work that needs to be done before we can get there. Now, again, if you're one of these businesses that doesn't necessarily need to use a, a custodian that uses qualified standard, I can serve you, uh, you know, like as soon as today. Um, 
as far as the what the difference between a regular custodian and a qualified custodian is in Canada, there's no such registration category. It's not as if I can I can go somewhere to a public desk and say, look, I want to register a qualified custodian. Tell me what, what do I need to do and what do I need to go by? We have a few national instruments that outline requirements for the custodian's clients. As far as, for example, National Instrument 31102, uh, you know, like regulates investment fund managers and it highlights, you know, like if you're an investment fund manager and potentially even deal with securities, you know, or, or, or whatever you might be setting, then the client assets do need to sit with a custodian that meets disqualified custodian definition. There's another national instrument uh, called 31103, which highlights what are the requirements uh, as far as using a qualified, you know, like Canadian or foreign custodian for uh, IROC dealer members as well. Although IROC, IROC for any uh, listener that might not be familiar, is a self-regulated organization recognized by the Crown. They regulate the investment industry in Canada. So it, it actually stands for the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada. Uh, <clears throat> There's no official guidance from them just yet as far as can their dealer members get into the space. Uh, you know, like when and if that is to arrive, the requirements of uh, who do they need to use and what standard that as custodian need to fit are outlined in this national instrument 31103 that I just mentioned. So the, 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 it, it's one of those, to some degree, you could argue that we're trying to play doctor without a doctor license. From uh, another angle, I would argue that, uh, look, this is a new type of operation, which we know how to perform best. And uh, you tell us what we need to get as far as, uh, you know, like putting a license in place and getting properly recognized. And, you know, like we're, we've been working in good faith with the regulators since, since day one. And we're very much so interested in having a qualified custodian in Canada to really enable this, this space to grow. There's a, you know, like an entire market of investment fund managers, IROC dealers, uh, you know, that would like to build structured investment products on top of this asset class that mm. currently cannot launch anything or get to market with anything without passing through some very serious, uh, you know, like hoops. Mm. Just to give you one example, you know, like we do have a Bitcoin closed end mutual fund uh, that's listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange built by this uh, investment fund manager called, called 3IQ. Uh, you know, like for them to get that registered and it was a Canadian first and it was a world first, as far as I can tell, it was the first, uh, you know, publicly listed retail facing uh, product that it can just, uh, you know, buy with a brokerage account. Uh, they had to convince the regulator through you know, multiple hearings and uh, you know, multiple applications and filings over a period of years, you know, so you can imagine how much that ends up, you know, like costing you end of the day, uh, you know, like as a, as a company and go, you know, set up this, I would argue, semi-convoluted structure in place where there's a foreign custodian that holds the assets, which is Gemini over in the United States, you know, because again, there is no custodian in Canada that meets qualified status today. Uh, and then with Gemini holding the asset, they had to find a local banking partner that would, you know, like wanted to, uh, you know, be in the mix and take some of the responsibility that that's happening there, which is Seidel Bank, as far as, you know, providing the necessary regulatory oversight uh, into, into what's happening, and then convince the Ontario Securities, uh, uh, you know, commission and the Canadian Securities Administrators, you know, like a uh, large umbrella at the top, that this type of product is in the public interest for it to be approved and listed. And then once that was said and done after many, many years, uh, you know, they finally managed to get something approved. And, uh, you know, like there's many others like them that would like to build such a kind of product and just open access to the space. And, uh, you know, but not everyone has the grit and the drive and, you know, the purse to necessarily pursue a multi-year, let me try to register this. And then end of the day, it's still a business bet from their perspective. Like if mm. I work, if I don't. Mm. Uh, also, this is, this is our goal and this is what, what we're trying to do in Canada and enable in the space. Let's build a local solution that everyone can confidently use that enables this ecosystem to flourish and that enables us to keep the assets at home. You know, it's just the, the, the fact that retail investors is, you know, the savings and, uh, you know, like investment portfolios are kept uh, across the border gives me a slight pause. I mean, obviously we're, we're neighbors, we're very close as, as far as cultures goes and, and as, as, as far as 
anything goes, you know, like in terms of the US and Canada relations, but you know, like it's a, it's a shaking and tense, uh, you know, like set of affairs worldwide at the moment. And I'd mm. much rather see those assets stay in Canada rather mm -hmm. than uh, go to some other jurisdiction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Oh, I, I can I can definitely get behind that one. I I agree. I mean, like I think borders are closed still, right? Or are they open now? I mean, people aren't technically allowed or weren't allowed at one point to go back and forth, but bitcoins are allowed to be held there. That's fine, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't need to go it's through the RSV. RSV. Oh, by the way, full disclosure, I am an advisor to uh, to Three IQ. Um, and so, oh, but yeah, but I, that, that I didn't know. Nice. Yeah, not a, not a huge advisor and probably not very helpful, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, but I, I I agree with you though, man. Like I think uh, I think you know I, I'm sure Fred would have uh, would have you know loved to have gone with a Canadian uh, qualified custodian if if one existed and uh, uh, you know um, okay, so I guess just to get back, so that's a fascinating story, man. I mean, you know, props, congrats. I don't know what to say, like uh, on just coming this far. I mean, to be able to service even you know, kind of the companies that you're, you mentioned earlier to ha have like a lion's share of, you know, the, the custody in Canada on your platform. Um, and it's not just Bitcoin, right? From what I understand, it's, it's like multi crypto, like you have other crypto assets that you support. Is that correct or not really? Yes. So first of all, thank you. Uh, you know, like it, it has been a long journey for us. We're still very much so at the, at the beginning of the, of the journey and the story for us, mm. you know, but uh, we're, we're just emerging with a solution. We hope to get qualified status at some point this, this coming year. We hope that there, there will be a, you know, like a bespoke clear regulatory framework for this asset class in Canada, which, uh, you know, like that's, I hope that something will, will come over next year as well. Uh, you know, to build a business in, in, in this space and to build this type of business, which is a deep tech, you know, like heavy infrastructure play, mm. uh, usually it takes tens of millions of dollars to even get something started and get and get to market with. And, uh, you know, like it, we're one and a half million dollars in and we're, we're doing pretty well. We have, a, you know, like a, a product that's five. Uh, we have paying customers. We're, we're getting close to break even. And, uh, you know, like with a little bit of luck, we'll be able to scale this significantly over the over the coming years. So, uh, you know, like very challenging uh, to a lot of uh, degree. We had to build 10 times the product with a tenth of the funding that you typically see for, for these kind of companies. But uh, we never shy away from from a challenge. Uh, sorry, if I. I hey, yeah, no, that was good. No, I was going to say is, is that on the other on another note, um, you know, just to just to kind of maybe call out the the pink elephant. I'm like a, a master pink elephant caller outer. <laughs> um, quadriga, right? Yes. Uh, you know, the the 250 million dollar pink elephant um, in the room. You know, um, I don't think again I've publicly ever shared some of my stories around around those guys. But but you know, just maybe from a high level though, uh, you know, for people again around the world listening, because I mean a lot of the regulatory things we're talking about are somewhat in response to kind of what happened in Canada a couple of years ago. And uh, do, you, do you want to maybe, I don't know, pick up on that thread a bit, like just uh, address it and, you know, and, and I don't know, at least explain uh, what's going on here in Canada. 100%. And for the listeners at home, like I still need a bit more coffee this morning because in case you didn't notice, I almost forgot what Sunny asked me before, but you're you're graceful enough to do a nice segue into, the, into Quadriga. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it, it happens. It's been a long year. Uh, a, a bit about uh, Quadriga CX, if for whoever's not familiar with that story, uh, it was like a, you know, West Coast based uh, crypto trading platform, I guess, or exchange where they're very overloaded, you know, because like people publicly use exchange, exchange has an entire set of connotations and definitions and, you know, like the, the actual body of law that we have and, and, and regulatory instruments that, that, you know, deal with marketplaces in Canada. Um, so it was a crypto business. Let's put it this way. It was, it was not an exchange by, by any, like it was an exchange in the, in the sense that it allowed you to swap assets with other asset holders onto their platform. Now, what happened there is uh, at some point, the, the founder went to India and I believe uh, got infected and developed complications from uh, Crohn's disease, died there. Uh, and uh, we, you know, like when, when, when 
uh, a, a trustee was appointed to take over the business and to effectively try to, to get the, the investors' assets back to them, they realized that a lot of the investor assets weren't actually there and they've been gone for many months, you know, like the roughly 250 million worth of crypto as well as fiat was uh, lost and, you know, only partially recovered after about a year and a half of, uh, of investigation. And, you know, what, what was happening there is the Quadriga CX uh, founder was effectively taking, uh, you know, like uh, clients' money, both fiat and crypto in, would, you know, introduce a few numbers in a database and say, look, you have this trading balance that's happening, but because the assets would never go off of the platform, like it was also offering custodial functions to, to, to them as well, and people rarely withdraw, especially if they're interested into trading, um, you know, he was taking the assets and going and running and trading for his own account, you know, uh, on, on, on the exchanges such as Kraken, uh, you know, like using them to run the operations of the business. I believe he bought a few properties as well, you know, like at least one, one mansion that was part of the, the litigation process. And when effectively he was running a revolving door system where as long as the people that were withdrawing funds on the platform, he had enough liquidity on hand to fulfill those, everything seemed normal from the outside looking in. And then, uh, you know, like when, uh, when again, he was no longer handling the business, uh, it, it turned out that the, the business was as poorly mismanaged as you would expect that kind of business to be in the sense that it was not only outright fraudulent and in def default of security laws and, you know, obviously a lot of the consumer protection laws as well. But, uh, you know, like they haven't been even keeping any sort of not, not accurate, but any sort of books and records for the last few years of operating the business. And also like not even a basic, uh, here's QuickBooks in place that tracks what's actually happening here. And, um, you know, like it was, a, it was a very cold shower for everyone uh, in Canada, you know, the investors as well as the regulators, as well as the, you know, like uh, enforcement agencies. So, uh, you know, like it was, it, it did put a stain on the space as a whole. It did put a stain on, on the asset class for a while. And, uh, you know, it, it made everyone extremely wary of who do we deal with in the space and, you know, like what exactly can we do uh, as far as both regulation goes, but then, uh, you know, like as far as, uh, you know, like how the roles and responsibilities should be, should be split between marketplace participants to prevent this kind of stuff from, from happening again. And, uh, one thing that became clear out of the process, and uh, it's not, uh, I don't think that this necessarily came as a surprise to anyone in the space because this is the, the split that happens in traditional industries. The custodian, the entity that holds the assets uh, for the client should be separated from the trading in exchange platform itself. You know, so those should be independent entities in the sense that, you know, say if, if there is a case that one of these trading and exchange platforms turns out to be fraudulent or mismanaged or operated in a way that's not in, in full compliance with the existing set of regulations, there's at least, uh, you know, like an additional exit point for the investor where they can go directly to the custodian and say, I want to get my assets back and please cut them access to my assets. And obviously a regulator or an enforcement, uh, you know, like body can come over with an injunction order and uh, do the same at any point in time. And I think this is a, you know, like this is the way to go as far as uh, splitting uh, responsibility, uh, splitting the responsibilities of who holds the assets and, and, and who does the, the trading. Fraud cannot be technically mitigated, or at least not fully. Uh, you know, like if it, if we could have made fraud technically impossible, we would have done so. Uh, you know, like probably like 50, 60 years ago, mm. once uh, once we had the necessary technologies in place. So best we can do is mitigate it. Have clear regulation in place. Have clear mm. checkpoints. Have oversight. Have third party auditing functions into the, these businesses. And you know, like if we do see something go wrong, we act on mm. it at the very first, uh, uh, you know, possible time, rather than uh, that business been operating fraudulently for many years. And then we figured out after the fact, once the founder died, that the assets haven't actually been there for, mm -hmm. you know, like at least a year at the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, really sad for that to happen. You know, I, I don't think I've publicly ever shared my story, but I, I will maybe at one point in the future. I actually, these guys approached me back in 2014 or something and 2015 and, and I had a, I had a chat with them and, 
they essentially openly admitted that they were not good people and like in a private conversation with me and uh and I, my approach was always just to maintain distance from them and just not invite them to my events or work with them and not deal with them, not send them my ID, do anything. But I do think back to that. And I think, you know, should I have done more? Um, and then that's partially why I'm kind of doing, you know, these YouTube videos. Like, I don't know how many people are going to watch it, but I just want to make sure that, you know, I put a spotlight on people who are, I think, do, are doing good work. And then also publicly maybe talk a little bit about, you know, people who aren't. <laughs> Call them out, you know, in real time. Uh, now, yeah, Quadriga, so, it's too late. <laughs> but yeah. I don't mean to sound preach over here, you know, but, but, but this kind of stuff is exactly what makes it complicated and, uh, you know, just doesn't allow us to move as fast as we could technically move as far mm -hmm. as innovation goes in the space. Mm -hmm. uh, regulation is there for, for, you know, like for, for a reason. And then the reason is very clear and simple in some spaces, like when you're dealing with money, for example, this mm -hmm. is not, you know, like we're not, uh, uh, this is not a hobby, like we're not, uh, you know, like collecting uh, model, uh, you know, like cars or, or, or anything like that. This is we're dealing with people's money. If something wrong uh, happens, people lose their shirts, you know, their livelihoods are affected. And the reason that we have this kind of regulations in place is in the financial ecosystem, there's a finite set of business models that are viable that, you know, have the consumer at the forefront and, and, you know, aim to protect the investor as much as possible and provide as much safety as possible and still make money. Whereas there's an infinite number of scams and frauds and Ponzi schemes that you can run. And frankly, a lot of the stuff that's been happening, you know, like in the, in the crypto space. And again, with this in 2020, we hope to get rid of that bad reputation. But the last few years, you know, like a lot of well, weird stuff has been happening, especially around the initial coin offerings. And frankly, if you take a look at it from, from the outside, it's the same playbooks that were being run in the 70s with pen and paper. You know, the technology changed. The fraud was the same. And if you don't regulate the fraud and if you, if you don't enforce the, the, the rules and if you don't push out the bad actors, a free market economy will effectively make you uncompetitive. Because if I want to run a regulated business, and again, there's only so many ways that that can be done that you keep the investor safe and, uh, you know, you keep the consumer safe and you also, uh, you know, make some form of money with it, you can compete with all these fraudulent mm. schemes. And then effectively the free market will push you towards, now I got to bend the corner to make sure that I stay in business and I survive. And that, that's what we don't want. That's exactly why we have regulations in place. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so I guess you talked a little bit about your story. You talked about your company's story. And by the way, um, uh, yeah, I, well, I guess the, the, the third kind of, you know, I don't know, main question, if you will, that I like to ask is, what is one truth that you hold that most others, you know, in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? In Bitcoin or in crypto as a whole? Let's start with <laughs> Bitcoin. Are... <laughs> then we can maybe move to crypto. And then the final final of this question is like outside mm -hmm. of our ecosystem completely, right? So just generally uh, in the world. But yeah, but yeah, but let's start with Bitcoin. Like, so what's one thing that you believe true to be true within, let's say, the Bitcoin ecosystem to start with um, that you think others are, uh, I don't know, missing? Yeah. Uh... I don't, uh, you know, to a very large degree, like I don't, uh, I don't believe I know something that no one else does or it hasn't necessarily been figured out before. And I would argue that that's the thing that I do know, but it's not necessarily recognized as much. So mm. what, let me dive in a bit deeper. Like what, what do I mean by that? Uh, there's, uh, there's this French saying, if I'm not mistaken, like the more it changes, the more it's the same. Mm. Uh, you know, like systems go through through cycles and then devolutions. And, uh, you know, the financial system that we currently have in place, the traditional one, although it's been operating for, you know, like at least 150 years, I kind of beat it. Some would argue that it roots trace back all the way to, you know, the Medici family and, and you know, the Middle Ages. Uh, the this this one is uh you know like no no different there's no no exception happening there we're going through a cycle of innovation we're going through a cycle of uh you know like reinventing a lot of the core concepts and adjusting them for the modern day and age and for the technology that we currently have available but end of the day the split again of roles and responsibilities and uh 
you know, like how the final picture would look like won't be necessarily that much different. Like it will be a, a doubt to this world, but uh, the first principles, I guess I would argue, stay the same and are, are consistent across, across ages. And uh, like I, I strive to be a first principles thinker. I don't like doing things that I don't fully understand or, uh, uh, you know, like if I can't necessarily really arrive it on the spot and figure out if, uh, you know, like this is the, the, the correct way to approach things in a particular situation or not. A lot of that is, you know, partly due to excitement, partly due to, uh, you know, the people that are uh, building in the space being of a certain age, uh, you know, like it's being glossed over. You know, like a lot of the stuff that's even happening in the in the DeFi parts of the space are this is novel, no one's seen this before, and uh, uh, you know, and uh, the regulators don't know what they're talking about, and the folks in the traditional space don't know what they're talking about. And again, if you take a ten thousand foot view on it and you look at the space as a whole, mm. I'm like, we we've already getting to the point where if we want to scale further. Uh, it is becoming a bit more centralized and concentrated in the sense that, it, look, even running a, a, an Ethereum full node these days isn't as easy, or a Bitcoin full node isn't as easy as a few years ago. Like you need, you know, some pretty beefy hardware. You need something with enough space, uh, you know, like on the hard drive to actually download the, the full ledger. Uh, you need Wait, to so, so just, just to be clear on that. So you said even Bitcoin is almost impossible or is it just Ethereum? Not, not not impossible by any shape or form, and thank God, because like this is we need as much decentralization and distribution of nodes yeah. like globally, worldwide to, to make this stable. But it is harder than a few years ago. Mm. So and look, I I will drive it to the absurd now. So this I'm making a hyperbole to to to, to illustrate the point. So don't take it at face value. Mm. But uh, it's already getting to the point where look, if you want to run a full node and if you want to validate every transaction, if you want to, mm. you know, do your own signing and broadcasting, it takes quite a bit of power and quite a bit of resources to get that done. And it's getting concentrated into corporations and organizations and intermediaries and trust actors and all of this and that. Mm. One day at some point, uh, you know, like once it's it's a whole like whitelisted set of <laughs> companies that are operating these nodes, someone will say, why are we exposing our, you know, like public internals over the public internet for anyone with a third party blockchain explorer to dive into and inspect all of our transactions and see our traffic? Let's put this on a private net, <laughs> you know, and now you're back to square one. And then a few years later, someone comes over and says, what if we had this decentralized peer to peer system where you can send value from here to there? You see, that, that's kind of how the, the cycle tends to unfold. Mm. But this is a much needed cycle of, creative destruction and then renewal on top. So we actually adjust the technologies for, again, the day and age that we live in. Like I can travel across continents in eight, nine hours, like with a, with a cross Atlantic uh, flight, right? Mm. Uh, why should my money take two days to settle from a registered investment account into a savings account? Like if I want to run a trade, mm. like those are the, those are the kind of pieces that this, this technology and the innovation that, you know, uh, the, the blockchain itself, again, as a, computer science fundamental breakthrough. That's how I look at it. Like this is what this is bringing to the space. It is enabling a new class of applications. Yes, for a period of time, the roles and responsibilities in the split, you know, like it's a bit vague until the roles get cemented, you know, cause now you have miners and you have, uh, you know, like the people that run full nodes and you have people that run light nodes and then you have the people that run the trading platforms and that needs to cement and get fully established. Once it does get fully established, we will end up with a better system, but that better system, uh, you know, like I don't expect any of the first principles to be necessarily be as different as the principles of the existing financial system. You know, like you have, you have this international framework, which is called, you know, like principles for financial market infrastructure. And frankly, a lot of it, like 90% of it applies to this space. And, uh, you know, like I strongly encourage everyone that's building a business in the space to give it a, give it a thorough read and see how much of it they can adopt, incorporate and put into place. I'm a, I'm a big, uh, you know, uh, fan of, uh, 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 Nassim Nikola Tadev's work. And uh, I believe it was him that initially came up with this, with this maxim of, uh, if you see a fence and you're not entirely sure why it was put there, don't take it out. Mm. It was probably put there for a reason. Mm. You know, like, no matter what 
prison is until you take the fence out and then all of a sudden you have the wolves you know like attacking in at night and you weren't even aware that there's a pack of wolves around and that's why the original owner put the fence in but with a lot of financial market infrastructure and principles for how to build the system safely there's a lot of fences that have been put in place you know like historically and there's a lot of insight and wisdom that's codified into those rules and protocols mm. that's being glossed over by the new generation of people that to some degree you know like are uh are reinventing the wheel. So uh, I'm trying to do as much as I can to soak that up, you know, understand why those principles are in place. Uh, do the translation work? How do I adapt them to this new execution context and this new technology and, and paradigm that we're operating in? But then put as many of them in place as possible because again, the, the risks when dealing with something like uh, money are real and, uh, you know, the consequences are severe. So this isn't... Uh, you know, like we, uh, it's money, like I'm not saving babies over here, but I'm taking it as serious as, uh, you know, say like a medical profession position. Like you can't, you can't play with people's livelihoods like that. So that's, that's where I stand on it. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, and you know, I, I know you said uh, most of it was like very technical and most of what we've been talking about is also very like either regulatory heavy or technical. Um, but, you know, to running a business is also a very uh, big human side to it. Right. Uh, so curious, um, you know, maybe on a personal note first, like one one topic that really interests me is this topic of anxiety. I feel like it's kind of like money, you know, in the sense that uh, it's one of those topics that nobody wants to talk about, but everybody Everyone experiences has it. it. Well, what, what? Everyone has it, but nobody. Everyone knows what has it, it. Everyone knows what it really is. Their relationship with it is a bit weird. So, so, and and I, I would argue that you know an entrepreneur goes through that doubly so, and then a Bitcoin entrepreneur goes through it maybe hundred x or so. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably uh, wrong on that, but I'm just saying. And so do you have hacks? Do you have, I don't know, jumping jacks? You go for a swim? I don't know. Do you, do, do, do you meditate, journal? Like w what's your, I don't know. Do you have some mechanism by which you can like ground yourself? Uh, yes. And a hundred percent. It is a stressful job and uh, not to diminish anyone else's work or, or, or job. Like every job is challenging and stressful in, in its own ways. Uh, again like more so when you're dealing with 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 people's money so uh f for myself personally like the way that I, I keep myself grounded is heavy physical exercise like that's a thing that i i incorporated in my routine uh, you know six years at this point five six years um you know like it's very hard to make the monkey brain like quote unquote uh, you know like shut shut down at the end of a business day like you've you, you've done 10 calls, you've done a few meetings, you know, like you've, you've sent 50 emails out. There's a lot of contracts and invoices and, you know, like the stuff that's happening within the, within the company. And then, you know, like it's hard to say flip a switch. And now I'm going from what I'm doing into cooking dinner or watching a movie or spending time with, with friends and family, right? So for me, the way that I get that switch done is I finish my, my work day. My apologies. <clears throat> I finish the work day. I immediately transition into a, you know, high intensity workout routine. 30, minimum, 30 minutes at a minimum, 45 minutes is what you want to get. If you want to get something out of it, like one hour ideal, if you can put the put the time and practice into it. And there is, um, you know, like mostly, the, like there's strength and there's there's conditioning. Like I do, uh, I've been training uh, self-defense. Uh, I've been doing Krav Maga for the last four and a half years. Uh, I'm also doing Muay Thai on the side, you know, like gym a few uh, times a week, you know, like if I can uh, hit the, the scroll like now with all these lockdowns going on so uh you know like you 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 go for 45 minutes it forces you to be in the present moment like i'm lifting this weight i'm doing this additional rep i can't be thinking about the business i can't be thinking about you know like any transactions that might be transpiring or not i have to be focused on you know engaging the muscles mm -hmm. and getting this push-up done and at the end of that as much as you know, like it sometimes, uh, you know, like sucks to, to, to like, I just finished a very tough work day. Now I'm going to do something just as challenging on the physical side of it. When you're done with it, it feels like a brand new reset. It's as if I got a full night's worth of sleep. I woke up, you know, like in the, in the morning again, and all of what happened throughout the day is washed off. And now I can worry about the rest of my evening, you know, like read an article, listen to a book, watch something on YouTube, uh, you know, like again, cook, spend time with friends and family. So this is this is how I do the switch. This is how I how I do the switch. What time around? I'm just curious. 
at what time oh you hit my. the gym? So I am working on a, <laughs> as an unorganized schedule as I, uh, as I can. So it's usually very late, uh, late evenings. Like I, I tend to like a typical work day for, for us in the space. And uh, one day when there's more resources and uh, maybe the space is more established, again, we're going to adopt some of the stuff that's happening in the traditional space, which is 24-7, 365 uh, trading and running a business isn't healthy. Like you do need some, some evenings <laughs> or weekends. But uh, currently, like at, at this moment, it's 24-7, 365. So typical workday for me is, you know, like I, I wake up fairly late, like around 9, 9.30. By 10.30, I'm, I'm in work mode. It usually goes until 10.30 p.m. 10.30 p.m., I, I do my workout, you know, like 11, 15, 11, 30, I'm done. Midnight, you know, like I'm fully showered, you know, and the, and the day is officially done. And then midnight to 2 a.m., 3 a.m., like that's my personal time. So I, I read something, I cook something, I, I, I take care of my hobbies, I play guitar, whatever I might want to do with the evening. But that's, that's usually how I roll. So very late workouts, they do keep you up, you know, like more at night because of it. Uh, you do get used to it past a certain point. So, you know, like when it's, when it's time to sleep, just, just go to sleep. Um, <clears throat> cool. Well, I like that, man. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, anything else in terms of any questions that you wish I'd asked that maybe I didn't in terms of, I don't know, your story, the business, anything tangential to any of this? Uh, I mean, we covered a lot of ground. I'll be honest with you. Like, I, I you know, like, I don't want to, uh, like, obviously, like, you you, you need to, 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 to run the conversation, but I'm just as interested in your story as as. I am in. Oh yeah, dude. In mind, like I, I know my business. I yeah. talk about it on ends, like all day long. I'm, I'm proud of it. So I don't know. Maybe if, if you want to spend a few minutes and tell me a bit about what, what you're working on these days, if if you're not. For sure, for sure. I would love to. And and even if you wanted, I mean, if, at some point in the future, if you want to do more of like a like a kind of how I did a, a longer session, we can do that. But things are really good, man. Things are really good. I'm I'm very grateful right now. Um, you probably know I started India's first Bitcoin platform called Unocoin. Um, our investors are like guys like Barry Silbert. And um, I think last month, uh, was it last month? Two months ago, Tim Draper invested. And so nice. we have about 1.6 million users. Um, you know, and about two years ago, the central bank tried to essentially stop banking services to Bitcoin companies uh, in India. I know I'm, you know, kind of zipping through like you know like uh i'm sure a few netflix uh <laughs> like uh, seasons but uh but long story short um all three judges you know kind of <laughs> sided with with us and you know banking was back on as of march so he went full um, on to court against the central yeah bank yeah in the supreme court against the central bank and it was quite amazing because it, i mean in my view because it was, I think it was the second time in history that the central bank had over, or sorry, the Supreme Court had, has overruled the central bank. So it was quite unprecedented. We had, you know, the chips, I guess you could say, were stacked up against us. Um, but yeah, I guess the thing I, you know, in fact, the the interview I just launched uh, yesterday was was with Nishit Desai and Surreal Desai, who are the people who, like the lawyers that that were literally, you know, kind of uh, by our side since since the beginning. And um, and then, you know, I kind of, and then the other project I'm, I'm involved with and I have been involved with for a long time is a company called, uh, Paycase, which is a Canadian company. And, uh, yeah, that, that's got an illustrious, uh, history, but we, you know, we essentially long story short is an OTC desk in Canada. And so it would be good to, you know, explore some partnerships on, on perhaps both fronts. Um, and then the third thing is this, this, this podcast thing. I don't know. Again, I don't even know what to call it. It's called Bitcoin stories, but, I'm having a lot of fun with it, um, you know, and and like I said, the idea is just to kind of, um, I've been through a lot and, you know, George, I was like earlier this year, um, like because of the, the pandemic and everything, the news around what happened in India with the Bitcoin situation that I just explained kind of got like overshadowed. I think it was like March itself that, <laughs> that, 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 that all this happened, right. Or whatever it was. And so, um, you know, it is what it is, right? But I kind of felt a bit disheartened by that. And and so part of my goal was like, I, I wish more people would care about this. And so I thought, oh, well, you know, we, we obviously have reporters writing about it a little bit. We have, um, you know, I used to always joke like, oh, someday I want to make a Bollywood movie about all of it, like I did earlier. And then finally, it hit me like two months ago. I was like, the best way to get something is to give it. 
So instead of me trying to figure out how I'm going to tell my story, I was like, I'm just going to tell everybody else's story. And if people get interested in mine, great. If not, that's okay. And along the way, I kind of, uh, yeah, man, I just got really captivated by, by capturing everyone's story. And I'm doing this and my goal is to kind of just every day, every effing day, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a new interview. Uh, it's like an hour and a half to two hours long. And, and I mean, you know, NGU with the, with the YouTube views and all that. So it's definitely, it's definitely, you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of uh, not really, you know, trying to, I'm not putting too much into it in terms of hopes or expectations, but the main thing is I'm having a lot of fun with it. You know, I'm having these conversations with people like you, even who I've known for years, but never really knew. Right. And so it's fascinating, man. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. So many questions. We either need to take this offline or I need to start a podcasting issue. Bro, I'm down. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. If you want to do the reverse, and a lot of people, you know, some people who are who have the time. I know you're super busy, but if in the next week, month, year, day, hour, whenever you want, we can do another follow up, and and I can, you know, oh my god, whether it's Paycase, whether it's Unocoin, you know, and just all the other things like Buttercoin. I was a part of Kraken, and you know, it's like I've had. I've had an insane, like, you know, like just, I just mentioned, like I even met the Quadriga guys, like who wouldn't want to know that story? Like, you know what I mean? I definitely want to share it. I'm scared to share it because I don't want to have like a rich debt, rich dead guy after me, if you know what I mean. (laughs) Uh, So I kind of like, I'm like, ah, don't talk smack about those guys. Just, you know, stay in your lane. But, but you know, I don't know, man, life is is short. That is very interesting. Like it's, uh, uh, like I wasn't in the space at the time, so I can't call myself an OG or anything by any shape or form, but you've been around the block since, since day one. And uh, look, with the, with the Quadriga guys, I will, I will say one, one mention. I, when I was reading through the way I see settlement, uh, settlement, like the, the way I see uh, uh, staff uh, report that they gave at the end of the investigation, there was one piece over there that struck me as a, you know, like that deserves its own Netflix show, <laughs> like at some point. Uh, <laughs> But uh, there's a piece where they were saying G- Gerald Cotton used to take private flights to meet people. They, you know, like they at some point they had a problem with a payment processor or something like this. You take private flights to meet people to exchange briefcases of cash to get to get funding into the platform. And I'm sitting there reading through the through the document. And I'm wondering. How do you like the, the level of the lack of self-awareness? Like, how do you wake up one morning and you say, I'm going to board this flight to meet this person that I probably never met to exchange a briefcase of cash and not ask yourself any second questions? Like, well, what, dude, uh, again, I, I, I said, uh, uh, when I met them initially, I was literally at Decentral, what you talked about earlier. Uh, I used to rent space from Anthony. By the way, I interviewed Anthony recently as well. He's one of the co-founders of um, That's great. I haven't spoken Ethereum. To him yeah, he's, I, I'm a big, uh, big fan of Anthony's. And uh, I was working for Buttercoin, this, co- this company that was literally backed by Google. And we had come out of Y Combinator. We we're based in San Francisco. They had hired me. I was out of <laughs> Toronto. And and uh, one in one of the Bitcoin, you know, meetups, uh, not uh, Gerald, but uh, initially it was the other guy, Pat, Pat, I forget his name, but he came up to me Pat and he Hayden, said uh, uh, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He came up to me and uh, introduced himself. And, and uh, yeah, it was... Long story short, uh, they were like, hey, you know, let's go for coffee. Both of them, you know, came and uh, pretty much told me that the two of them met while like scamming people or something like they were scamming other people (laughs) and they met and then they were like, oh, my God, we're a match made in heaven. I'm paraphrasing, but that was essentially the summary of the conversation. Ever since then, I was like, I came home, I told my wife, I'm like, let's just keep our distance from these guys. And, and, you know, and like, I'm working for a Google venture back company. So like, if customers are like, hey, can I bring in, you know, duffel bags full of cash? We're like, like, hell no. Like, what are you talking about? And so, you know, so that's why I think there's a, there's this term called market leader that kind of bugs me because because it's, I don't think it's about being the market leader for like a day or for a week or for a month or for a year. 
Like what you really matters is longevity and not being first to market even, but to be last to market. Like Google is the last search engine. Facebook is the last social network. Like you want to be the one that sticks around, be the cockroach as, as you know, the drapers say. And so I think Unocoin has definitely embraced that, that kind of aura of, of the cockroach. <laughs> and I think we I, have, I, love, I have, I you have, concept. and you know, I think Bitcoin has, Bitcoin is the ultimate, you know, cockroach. It, it just doesn't die. People say it's dead every day and it comes back stronger. So anyways, George, man, um, listen, like I said, I'd be down to do a, a reverse kind of podcast and go, I have like literally hundreds of stories um, that are pretty epic, but I, I wanted to, you know, kind of keep this one on you. And, and it, I just, I thought it was fascinating what you shared. I thought it was lovely. It was inspiring. And uh, where do people, you know, if they want to tap into your train of consciousness, like, do you, do you do much tweeting? Are you a blogger? Do you do any, are you, uh, or do you, are you more of a private guy? Cause you know, I, I know a lot of people in crypto are obviously. Um, so first of all, thank you for, for having me here. I really appreciate the invite and, uh, we haven't spoken in a, in a, in a long time either. And, you know, I, I like learning about your work as well. Uh, I tend to stay pretty head down into my own work. You know, I don't do a lot of appearances. I don't do a lot of talks these days, you know, the event scene is, mostly remote these days with, with, with what's happening remote or non-existent mm. like those are the, <laughs> um and uh you know like it is it does feel good to every now and then just uh get out of the house metaphorically speaking and uh you know share share a bit about what we're building uh as far as the company itself you can find us on balance.ca uh i'm george at balance.ca uh i tend to get to inbox zero and I am one of uh, those people that if you email me I, I either reply in 15 seconds or in three weeks depending mm. on depending on what's happening and depending on the priority level so but there's always an open an open door there as far as <clears throat> stream of consciousness type stuff um, like I don't uh, write too much uh, uh, you know like I rarely publish anything and when I do it's on the company blog uh, I am semi-active on Twitter uh, in the sense that I do a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like I follow a few interesting people and I'm, I'm mostly looking for, uh, you know, like insight into what's been happening in the news cycle. Um, I do a lot of retweeting, you know, like sometimes I, I post stuff. Now, uh, you know, take it with a grain of salt. If you go to my feed, you might agree with a few things, you might disagree with others. I clearly state in my bio, uh, for me, it's about diversity of opinions. Sometimes I retweet stuff that I disagree with. Like it's not a retweet is endorsement or if I post yeah, a yeah. comment that I'm supporting the idea or anything of the sorts. It's more of a, this doesn't necessarily, this isn't necessarily getting the right amount of visibility or exposure. And I think like it deserves a second look. That's mm -hmm. how I look at amplification across, uh, you know, like social feeds and streams. So mm -hmm. uh, if you want to find me on, on Twitter at George underscore balance. Uh, nice. And then the company website handle, too? But I have to change. And the company so, website? www.balance.ca balance.ca right right a beautiful name okay man mm -hmm. uh with that you know i mean that covers pretty much everything so thank you i appreciate it i'm gonna get when i kill the uh recording here if there's nothing else number go up <laughs> you NGU, know like with or without it let's uh let's keep building for for this date <clears throat> and let's let's help it grow. yeah i was gonna say i mean i think you've definitely uh, uh you've definitely got inspired me to uh work out harder because i gotta do more of that i got i got a punching bag recently 130 pound one so oh, practicing nice. uh practicing a bit on that and uh and just in general man i i like your your worldview so so really appreciate it and uh we will catch up again soon a hundred percent you know i'll throw one one final Please. thing into the mix i am a certified uh you know beginner krav maga instructor like i teach hey at, uh, okay work at elite martial arts so Dude. if you ever want to drop in for a class or generally speaking anyone from the gta area that's listening when everything opens up again check it out elite martial arts you can find me there on wednesdays i teach the wednesday uh, pm class crazy man you know do you know who rory mcdonald is i just gotta mention this. oh yeah <laughs> bro he 100%. follows me on twitter he follows me no on twitter way. can you believe that shit that is crazy how crazy is that i gotta get him on this blog imagine him following you the two <laughs> ultimate fighters well one is the physical you're fighting on the bitcoin side but you, you know what i'm saying right like uh <laughs> Good you baby. do have a, uh you've brought in a ton of interesting uh folks from the crypto space on the podcast so far cool uh, if you want 
branch out and expand into MMA and like those kind of areas. I think well, uh, Rory's a spot a... on YouTube. Yeah, so right. Spotify. <laughs> Rory is actually a fan of crypto, believe it or not. I think that's why he follows. I think he was sponsored by Dash or something at one point. And I know Faraz, Faraz something like George St. Pierre's coach is a, I think a Bitcoin or a crypto fan as well. And so it's, you know, these two worlds are very in common, you know, like uh, that I, I watch UFC every weekend and to me, that is like, uh, it, it's so similar to Bitcoin. <laughs> Like if you I look at the Twitter saw, wars, you start to get all with more with Moreno recently, 100%, right? 100%. That's such a good so fight. awesome, right? It was so awesome. I like that that Moreno guy. He's uh he's he's a fun, he's a fun fighter, man. He's just got like he's like his his best line was he's like he's like figure out everyone's saying he's strong, he's fast, he's scary, he's like a god. He's like, but I'm Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> we said that. I was like, oh, I love this guy. Oh, he's so good. So good. Okay, buddy, we'll, we'll bring it to a close. And thanks again for uh, for your time.